Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the QT2 Systems Podcast Series, The Coaches at QT2. Our featured coach today, coach today is Coach Beth Peterson. Welcome, Beth. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining. So um, I want to start with, with where I almost always do, which is, um, can you just tell us when you came to QT2 as an athlete and then as a coach? Um, yes. In 2013, I started as an athlete. Um, it was June 1st. I remember it quite well. June 1st, 2013 with Tim Snow. And then as a coach, it was about a year later. So in May of 2014. All right. So I want to start with the, with the athlete piece and I'm guessing you didn't just like randomly pick up the phone and call Tim. So can you, can you just talk a little bit about how you like your story of how you came to QT2? Sure. So um, one of my very best friends, uh, Kim Schwabenbauer, she was, um, it was around the time that we were both transitioning from age group triathletes to um, racing professionally. Um, and we both had coaches, but she had switched and um, had started working with Jesse um, at QT2. And we would go on these bike rides together and she would tell me all these crazy stories of things Jesse said and what they did and nutrition stuff. And I'm like, this is, this is wild. This guy is crazy. I don't know about this stuff, but, um, you know, the proof was in the pudding. She improved greatly. She, um, made huge progress. Um, and it was exciting to watch. And I, it wasn't, but maybe nine months later that I was like, okay, I need to be a part of this too. So whatever this QT tooth stuff is, uh, I want in. And so, um, it was, you know, 2013, like I said, I, I gave them a call and, um, and I started working with Tim. So I'm, I'm just kind of curious, what kind of crazy story? Do you have one that you remember? Yeah, I remember one very well. So <laughs> both Kim and I are dietitians. Um, and so she, they had worked very closely. She had done an Ironman that fall. And so this was like a year before, like 2012, she had done an Ironman and Jesse had laid out a very specific um, fueling plan for her. And she went a little rogue. <laughs> um, I can't remember exactly what she did, but she changed something a little and she told him about it. And she was like, okay. She was like, oh, I think it worked pretty well. Maybe we could try this. And she was like, Beth, he was like, Kim, that's one strike, three strikes and you're out. And I was like, Oh my gosh. <laughs> like, what? Um, you know, and obviously it, you know, I want to say he was joking, but I mean, if you know, Jesse, maybe, maybe he wasn't, but either way, there was just all sorts of stories. And, and the training was hard. I mean, she had a lot of very long, hard workouts and stuff like that. So, um, definitely a little intimidated at first, but, um, it, it very clearly worked. So. Okay. Here we are. <laughs> so you came, you came over with Tim then in 2013 June, yep. you said June 1st, right? June 1st, I remember. <laughs> June 1st. So, all right. And so where were you at that point, like in your athletic career? Yeah. So I was racing pro by that, that point. Um, I think it was like my first full year or maybe I had the previous year as well. Yeah. I think I had the previous year. So I was, I was racing pro. I was pretty convinced that Ironman wasn't for me because I had had a couple Ironmans where it just didn't go that well, <laughs> to be honest. Um, I came from a running background and I was just totally bombing the marathons, just not running well. Running like, I kept running like 335, 338, 340, which is an amazing Ironman marathon. Don't get me wrong, but in the professional field, that is not going to get you anything. So um, at that point, I was pretty convinced that I didn't want to do Ironman anymore, but I wanted to race halves and I was going to be good at halves and all this, that, and the other thing. And, uh, and when I started with Tim, I was I mean, he waited a little bit, but like shortly after starting, he was like, so just so you know, like you're going to be an Ironman athlete, like you're actually going to do an Ironman this fall. <laughs> and I was like, oh, <laughs> okay, great. Um, 
but I did Ironman Wisconsin that fall in 2013. And it was a huge breakthrough race for me. And it really changed the tra trajectory of my professional um, career, I guess. Um, I think I ran like I'm going to get this wrong, but I think I ran like 315 off the bike, which was like a 20 minute PR in the marathon. Then that, that no same November, I ran 306 off the bike at Ironman Arizona. So it was, you know, he was, he was right. Um, I was definitely an Ironman athlete. Def I wasn't fast enough for halves. Um, but uh, but yeah, that was my first couple Ironmans with QT2 and Tim. <laughs> so you started, I mean, June 1st, Wisconsin is in September. So that's yep. not a lot of time. So what, what did you do in those couple months that changed the trajectory? Yeah, so a lot of it was fueling. Um, that was a big piece of it. He definitely helped with that. And like I said, I was, I'm a dietitian. like you should be able to f figure that stuff out. But, um, just because, you know, the type of dietitian I was, wasn't, you know, I wasn't a sports dietitian. So I, I had a lot to learn in that sense. And just because you know what to do, doesn't mean you do it right yourself, of course. So a big piece of it was fueling. Um, I did a lot more running off the bike. So that was something that was different um, and harder running. Um, and then um, another huge piece of it was the confidence piece of it. And just um, the belief that like he worked a lot with me that he really believed I could run faster. There was no reason why I couldn't. He had all the, this experience in working with, um, you know, QT2, working with pro um pro triathletes and so I was like all right I guess here we go so that was that was a big piece of it too okay so um all right so did, walk me through a little bit of I guess of your pro career then so that was 2013 you raced pro and until for how long um my last pro race was in the fall of 2017 I did Ironman Louisville in October um that was my last pro race. So, uh, yeah, I, um, qualified for Kona once, which, you know, as a pro, which I never would have believed was possible back then. I think it's different now. I've lost track of how, how pros qualify now. Um, but back then you had to, in my days you had to, um, it was a point system. So it wasn't a slot system. Um, you couldn't go to just one race and qualify. You had to earn enough points. Um, and, you know, because I wasn't winning Ironmans, I actually got second at that Ironman Wisconsin. That was the other thing. It was like, I never, up until that point, I never felt like, oh, I'm, I'm like a legit pro triathlete. Um, but, but therefore they're go, therefore going forward, I, um, you know, had gained a ton of confidence and, um, was able to race and earn enough points to qualify for Kona in 2014, um, that fall. So that was very exciting. Um, yeah, I did a bunch of Ironmans. I had a great time. Like I truly enjoyed traveling and went to a bunch of QT2 pro camps, which honestly was a highlight of the year sometimes, um, getting to train with my, with my teammates for, um, for a couple weeks in February and March each year. And, um, yeah, it was, it was a great time. Yeah. So, um, you said Louisville was your last race as your pro did as a pro, did you know that going in that it was going to be your last race? Was it a Okay. Yeah, it was. I had moved to Boston in 2015. Um, and I had a, I had a rough year in there. It was probably 2016. I had a stress fracture in my back and I had some injuries and things like that. And it was sort of like, I'm um, getting, I started racing triathlon late. So my pro years were later in my life. Um, and I started getting this feeling like, oh, when is it going to be it? And I can remember <laughs> asking Tim to, I, I was like, you have to promise me that you will tell me like, if I'm outliving my, <laughs> my, like I'm, I'm that pro that everybody's like, oh, why are they still racing pro? Like what's going on here? Like, you have to tell me when I'm ready. And he's like, ah, don't worry. Don't worry. You'll know when you're ready. 
Um, and in 2016, I, that was the year I was hurt, I think. And I was like, ah, maybe this is it. And I was like, ah, maybe one more year. And then he was right in 2017. I knew I was ready. Um, primarily because I just didn't want to have to train anymore, like what it takes to race at that level. Um, I was just tired of doing that amount of training and, um, there were other things I wanted to do in life. And so, so he was right. I, I knew, and I sort of targeted, um, Louisville as my last race, which was, it was fun. I went with a race with a couple friends and, um, my husband, John was down there and it was, it was good stuff. So, yeah. Yeah. Um, so what was it like to cross that finish line for the last time as a pro? Yeah. A little bittersweet for sure. You sort of feel like <clears throat> it's, it's hard. Yeah. You sort of feel like this, I've already reached this pinnacle and you sort of know, like there's not ever, it's never going to be this great again, in a sense. And in many ways I was wrong about that. I, I felt like I'll never be this fast again. I'll never get to race at this type of level again. Like, this is it like, like boo hoo. But, um, but you know, I learned that I, yeah, I'm definitely not as fast. <laughs> like, there's no doubt about that. Um, like my Z one pace back then is like my all out sprint pace now. So, you know, and for running and like, um, and stuff like that. But, but you, but I learned that like along the way after the fact, and it took a couple years, but I learned that I love racing and being fast and like racing at the highest level, but really what I loved all those years was the process and just, you know, putting in the work each day and having a goal and like working towards it. And that's like the, the, you know, the framework of your life and, um, and you don't, you don't have to like be setting PRs or you don't have to be racing pro to do that. You can do that in any way, shape or form. So, so, uh, so yeah, bittersweet, but good, still good. <laughs> well, you know, as, as I said, one of my athletes the other day, I said that person, I mean, you always have that. You always have those stories. That's your, you know, yes, that's, that's your life. You've got it. Yeah. And, um, but you didn't finish your last pro race and be like, okay, I'm done. No more training. Like you, you found some pretty new, new, exciting endeavors. Right. Right. I did. I did swear off Iron Man. I was like, no more of this mm -hmm. shenanigans. This, this is silly. Who wants to do this anymore? And I promised myself I'd never come back and race an Iron Man as an age grouper, but sure enough, I did. Um, I stayed away from Iron Man for like four years. I lasted four years and then I, I folded and I did, um, Ironman Tulsa in 2021. Um, but I've done a bunch of other things too. Um, one of the first things I did was, um, well, I ran a marathon right after that. I ran the Philly marathon with a bunch of friends. Um, the thought of just running a marathon was so novel. Like all I have to do is line up. I just need a pair of shoes. It, it was great. Um, that next year I ran the New York city marathon with my one with Kim, who had also at that point retired from pro racing. Um, and I did, I, oh, I did an off-road Ironman actually with Tim. So that was fun. We got lost, very, very lost. And I thought we were going to die. It was in North Dakota of all places. So <laughs> it was an amazing adventure. Um, but the biggest thing was, is I got pretty into mountain biking, um, and, and I, I brought a gravel bike too. So, um, pretty into both of those and sort of took up, um, my new goal of Leadville, um, 100 mountain bike. So that's kind of been a, a big focus the last couple of years. Uh, so your goal isn't though to participate in Leadville. What, what's your, what's your Leadville goal? <laughs> yeah. So the, for, I did Leadville, I, I, I qualified for Leadville in 2019 and I went out there and I was still running and biking a lot and not, I'm sorry, still running and swimming a lot, not really knowing what I was doing. I was like, uh, we'll see what this is all about. And I absolutely fell in love with Leadville. Leadville is, 
it's this old mining town and it's there's not much to it but it the raw beauty of it and it's a very high elevation it's the highest uh uh town in Colorado um and it was very hard it was one of those like wow like you do Iron Man and you're kind of like eh I can do anything like Iron Man is so hard and it is hard but um, Leadville was so hard too. And it was so out of my comfort zone. Um, but at Leadville, if you finish under 12 hours, you get a small belt buckle. Um, and then if you finish under nine hours, you get a big, bigger belt buckle. <laughs> um, and so the first year I did it, I, I think I went 10, 15 or 16 or something like that. And I was like, ah, maybe I can get that big belt buckle. Like, what would that take? And I remember telling Tim that, and he was like, oof, that's going to be hard. And I was like, well, that's all the motivation I need to try and get that done. Um, but in the meantime, the pandemic happened. So I got off track a little and I didn't do it for a couple of years naturally, because it didn't exist for a couple of years. And then you have to qualify for it or you have to find a way in. So I did it again last year. Um, and I went 905. So very close, but not close enough. So I'm trying to get, I'm, I'm back in the race this year. And that's the, uh, the sole goal is to get that big belt buckle. I'm sure you will. <laughs> <laughs> for what? I don't know. I don't even wear belts really, or bu belt buckles for that. Does anyone actually but... wear it as a belt buckle? I mean, oh yeah. Yeah, I don't know. People do. You'll see people like at the race, certainly with it on. There's a huge one. If you do 10 Leadvilles, it's even bigger. Um, so, you know, there's always goals is the point. There's always more goals. <laughs> there's always more belt buckles to be won. So. But uh, so you need to get your cowboy boots, though, with the belt buckle. Right? I do. I, I do. I, OK. Yes, I, <laughs> I'm going to need a belt and I'm going to need cowboy boots. To and match. Next thing and a hat, perhaps. A hat, and then we're going to put you on a fighting Bronco, and you know, <laughs> that'll be your next adventure. Okay. <laughs> All right, I want to go like backtrack now, back to 2014, and talk about the coaching piece of it. So, how did you um, decide to, to start coaching with QT2? Um, yeah, so that's a good question. Um, I was at a point in my <laughs> racing career where I was still working. Um, so I'm a clinical dietitian and I was working at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. I lived in Pittsburgh at the time. Um, at first I worked full time and then I went to per diem, which is kind of like a substitute teacher, but it's a substitute dietitian. Um, and I still, but I still worked four days a week, um, sometimes a little less, but it gave me more flexibility. And that next uh, that next spring and summer um, in 2014, I was starting to think like, oh, I want to, I really want to maximize trying to do this pro thing. And um, it's very hard because, you know, working a full-time job or close to a full-time job and trying to do Ironman training at a very high level is difficult. Um, and so... Tim actually presented the possibility of at the time QT2 was mostly triathlon focused, but they had this thing called 20 your it was called your 26.2 and it was run training. Um, and I had, I ha obviously had a running background. Um, that's, I grew up as a runner and, and that's how I got into triathlon in the first place. And he said to me, he said, you know, we have this year 26.2. We have a few athletes doing run programs or run training through it. Um, why don't you see what you can do with it? Like, it's not doing much right now, but do you want to see what you can do with it? And it was my first opportunity to coach. Um, and um, and I quit my job. I quit my job as a dietitian. It allowed me to still earn some income, focus a lot more on training, have the flexibility of working from home and things like that. Um, and so that was the start of it. Um, I, I wanted to change the name. So we changed it to the run formula and we took it from there. So it, it grew. We, we took on more coaches. Ironically, 
Um, one of the athletes that was in your 26.2, he was doing like a mission plan. Um, I somehow convinced him to, uh, do one-on-one -on -one coaching. And he was one of, he was one of my first one-on-one -on -one athletes that I coached up until like basically last year, he's taken a little bit of time off, but I've been with him that whole time. And, um, we still, we still joke about the year 26.2. So, <laughs> so yeah, so that was, that was, that was the start of it. So how did you just, I mean, out of curiosity, take a small piece of a triathlon business and turn it into running? Yeah. Well, I mean, I, you know, I had huge support. It was like a, the most ideal situation. I got to take this thing and sort of make it my own, but there was no risk. <laughs> I mean, who has that opportunity, right? Because if you want to start your own business and have your own thing, you take on a lot of risk with it. But I didn't have a huge amount of risk because it. I had the, the support of QT2 and the resources of QT2 and the all that QT2 brought. Um, so it was, it was such a gift to be able to do that. And I have always appreciated what Jesse and Chrissy and Tim did for me when they allowed me to that opportunity. Um, and so, so yeah, I don't know. We just, I convinced a few, I begged maybe, or convinced a few of the mission athletes to do one-on-one -on -one, and it just sort of grew from there. Um, I was so excited to be a coach and loved, loved doing it. And I think it, um, you know, that enthusiasm builds. And then, um, you know, we had, like I said, I had very good resources with all the QT2 and referrals from triathletes that wanted to do some running. And then, you know, it's word of mouth from there and stuff like that. So um, we took on some more coaches and then, you know, that widens the, the range and the, you know, the, the, out, the reach. And so, yeah, all that did it. Yeah. So um, at that point, while you were doing the, your 26.2, which turns the run formula from an athlete perspective, were you working with only runners then, or were you, were you working with triathletes as well? Yeah, no, I mostly just worked with runners for a long time. Um, even though triathlon was obviously my, what I was personally doing, um, I had the most interest in working with runners and they didn't need triathlon coaches. Like they had plenty of, of very experienced triathlon coaches. And, um, I sort of felt this pride that the runners were my, my mine, <laughs> if you will. And, um, and, uh, and I really enjoyed working with just runners. I love the simplicity of running, um, and the simplicity of, of coaching running. And, and so, so yeah, so it was primarily runners later on. I did take on some triathletes. I did work with some cyclists, um, things like that. So I did, um, branch out later on, but for years, I only worked with runners. Yeah. I think, I think when I came in, which was 2018, you okay. were just working with runners still then, right? Pro yeah, probably. Yeah. 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 So, um, so then, I mean, you, you started in that area and your responsibilities with, within QT2 expanded. You took on other, other top jobs along the way, right? Other yeah, I did. I did. I was like, they were like, oh, we need somebody to do this. And oh, Beth, what do you think? So, um, but no, so when I stopped racing professionally in 2017, along the way, I took on a few more responsibilities. I was a dietitian, as I said, and so the core diet, um, that was a natural progression. So I started doing some plans with them, um, some fueling and nutrition plans, um, and then when I wasn't racing professionally anymore, it was like, okay, well, now you sort of have this gap. You're not training as much. You don't need the as much time to race and go places and things like that. So you can definitely work more. And obviously from a financial standpoint, it helped as well um, and was a big piece of it. But, um, you know, Jesse and Tim gave me more responsibilities. Um, I've done a, a lot of different things within QT2. I've um, done inquiries. I've done billing. I've done, um, 
you know, all sorts of things, been on the leadership team. I've had, I've had uh, many different roles and I've always been very thankful for um, being a part of it and, um, you know, seeing it grow and change over the years is pretty exciting and it, which it continues to do. So it's pretty cool. And at one point I gave up my, my baby, my child, my run formula to, to Reem, to you. I didn't really give it up. It was time. Um, and obviously you, you've done amazingly well with it. So. Big shoes. <laughs> Big shoes to <laughs> It's why though, my, my, my son, who we were talking about before, the one thing he really listens to me is running. And he's like, it's just you run this. I was like, no, I just. Yeah, as he should, yeah. as he should. <laughs> it's fun though. So, um, so now I know that you, you've kind of, you moved back into the clinical area more though, right? From a nutrition standpoint. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, um, during the pandemic, when everybody was doing crazy things, <laughs> I think everybody was a little like, what, what is, what is the meaning of life anyways? <laughs> um, I initially, I was like, oh, I want to go back to school. Um, I have like, you know, when people are like, they talk about their toxic trait, my toxic trait is like, never like always wanting to do something else even when I get totally overwhelmed with filling my plate with all these things but I'm like oh but one more thing mm -hmm. one more thing would be great to add um and so at the time I we were doing a lot with QT2 and QT2 did amazingly well through the pandemic but it also was a tough time because obviously people weren't able to race and so um, coaching was different and it was just a tough time. And so at that point, I decided I was going to go back to school. Um, so I started working on my master's um, and then sort of the healthcare crisis at that point, because it was a major crisis at that time, um, sort of motivated me to get back into healthcare, um, into the clinical world. And so I initially took a per diem. So like a, a very flexible substitute dietitian type job. Um, but once I was back in the hospital doing, um, clinical work, I was like, no, this is, this is where I want to be. Um, it, I had, I always loved to do it, but it, the, the confines of the job didn't fit with trying to be a professional triathlete. So that was, that's what pushed me out. Um, and then I realized I still really love to be in that setting, um, love working with others for, for seven or eight years, I worked from home. So just going to work again was very different and something I think I needed at the time. And so, so yeah, so now I'm back to full-time clinical work. So, um, I work at Beth Israel Deaconess Center, uh, Medical Center in Boston. But through all this, you're still, I mean, you're still actively coaching athletes. Yeah. Yeah, because I couldn't give that up either. Um, in all honesty, I've had some athletes, like I said, that I've worked with from the very beginning, and I can't even think of not working with them. And I still really like it. I still really enjoy it. Um, I love to see people work towards something and enjoy the process and be in you. It's like you feel so thankful to be a part of that, like they let you be a part of that. Um, so yeah, I couldn't give that up. So for the athletes that you've worked with for a long time, like, I think that that creates its own challenges, right? How are you going to keep things interesting? How are you going to keep getting them better? So do you have any, any like tricks of the trade there that, that, that you've done with some longtime athletes to keep them yeah. interested in what they're doing? And Yeah. Yeah, that's a really good question because I have had some athletes that have been doing Z1 runs, 50 minute Z1 runs for, you know, 10 years. <laughs> um, and, and training is training. There's nothing like incredibly new or exciting about it. But I think, you know, in the athletes that I can think of that I've worked with for a really long time, um, it maybe it's, I think the way to keep it dynamic and exciting is to maybe they their goals change, their lives shift. Um, I have worked with one woman who I just love to death that 
Um, I can remember when she got engaged, um, when she got married, when she had her first child, when she had her second child, like we've lived through all of that together. And, you know, certainly over the time, the training, her particular training doesn't look like a ton different. Like you can only run training. Isn't that exciting? You can only come up with so many different things, but her goals have shifted like her, uh, when she runs and how she runs, that has all shifted. So, um, yeah, I, I think just living life along with people and, and changing goals, changing, having different goals. Part of it is like figuring out something that really makes somebody excited, you know, um, and then it doesn't, you know, the day to day training doesn't matter that much if you're really excited about the goal. Yeah. So would you say that you have a, a, a coaching philosophy? Mm -hmm. yeah. coaching philosophy um I would say honestly I've always felt this way as an athlete and I feel this way as a coach that um it's just about showing up honestly day to day um there is no one workout just like I was talking about it's not that exciting it's not that different you know um there's no one workout that's going to make or break you um but if you simply show up every day it's just like life <laughs> Honestly, that's why I love sport. It is so much like life. If you just show up every day, you just get up and you do it every day. Um, and that that consistency will pay off. And that's what I preach to them all the time. Like athletes can get very worked up about, and I did, I did it myself. I still do it. You get very worked up about, oh, this workout went horrible or, oh, this workout was so amazing. I'm ready for a huge PR, but it's not you know, it's really not about any of that. It's just about getting up every day, doing the work, enjoying the process, being consistent, and that's what will pay off. Mm -hmm. And so from any, if you work with an athlete over a long enough period of time, you're going to get their ups, but then you're going to start getting their downs as they get older, have more, you know, just running yep. beat up after, after a while. And yep. so, so what do you tell athletes that are not like that their PRs are behind them? Yeah. And I, I have, a I do have a lot of that. I've had, I've had, um, I've been through that with a lot of athletes and, and it helps because I've been through it myself. Mm -hmm. So, you know, part of it is finding new goals and different ways to motivate. So maybe it's a different kind of race. Maybe it's, going from like marathons to trail running or to an ultra or, um, you know, to something else, having a different kind of goal that that will help. For me, it was like changing to mountain biking or whatever. Fine. So finding something new that you're really excited about. Um, but it's also like so many of them, and, and I am personally the same way. So many of them just enjoy the process. So regardless of if the, you know, the marathon time is 15 minutes slower, it's like, I know I still enjoyed, you know, the training cycles and seeing the build up and, you know, the whole thing and just getting up every day and enjoying it. Um, and that, and I mean, that's a big part of it, regardless of what side of your PRs you're on. Um, but it, it seems, it seems like it becomes a little bit more important when you're on the other side of your PR. So, yeah. So what would you say is um, one of your biggest challenges that you've had as a coach? I think that's it. Like what we were just talking about, like when athletes sort of realize, like, I don't know, like I ran this race like five minutes faster last time and it's only a 5k, you know, um, sort of, so sort of working through that, um, I think sometimes when expectations don't line up with reality, um, as a coach, that can be difficult to build, uh, to deal with because you don't, you know, like it's hard to, to work around that and align expectations appropriately. Um, so I'd say that's hard. And then, um, the last thing would be like injuries are challenging, you know, they're challenging for anybody. You always feel responsible as a coach. So you don't want, or partially responsible. So 
you feel bad about it. And obviously it's, it's tough to work tough for obviously extremely tough for the athletes. So th those are, that's always usually a pretty big challenge. Knock on wood. We haven't had a ton of big ones, um, but, and you always learn from them, but yeah, those are hard ones. Yeah. So today on my, my Facebook memories, five years ago, I don't know if you remember this one was when I got my BQ at the spring BQ. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, you, which you trained me for coming off of an injury. So yeah, a lot of pool ringing the bell. Ringing the bell. I know, yeah. ring the bell, right? That yeah, was, I remember that. That was a fun race. Four of us came to Chicago. We all got our BQs that year, and then Boston got canceled, and you know we didn't end up doing it. But but that's yeah. okay. It was still like knowing to be able to come through that and not being able to get the run volume I normally would have building into a marathon yeah. and finding the other ways to, to do it and just following the process and trusting on that day. Yeah, was that was big. No, that was, that took some in, in, you know, very, um, like it, tough, like we, we made that work because it wasn't a traditional run buildup, you know, with your, uh, with your injury. Yeah. A lot of pool running and things like that. So pool running, lots of bike riding, mixing it up, but it worked. That was the best pace, not the fastest, although not too far off from my fastest, but the best pace marathon I'd ever done. It was the only time where the final six miles were my fastest. Yeah. Six. Yeah. Execution. Yeah. That's execution. so exciting when somebody executes yeah. a race. Yeah, that was that was pretty exciting. I I knew when I finished that 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 was the best I had in me, and that's always that's always a good feeling. So, um, so how about so on the other side, successes? Any that <clears throat> stand out in your mind? Coaching successes. Um, honestly you know, over the years, it's not, it's, you know, certainly they're like, you're saying there's been those BQs and, you know, things like that. Um, I coached a guy to his first ever Ironman. Like that was super, super exciting and fun. Um, but honestly, it's like, it doesn't even have to be a big thing. It's like, um, when somebody just realizes what they're capable of, and that could happen in like a workout that could happen. It doesn't even have to happen in a race, but that's like, I love when like you see the light bulb go off, like, oh yeah, I can do this or, oh yeah, this is possible. Like that's, that, you know, that's what every coach lives for. Um, and also when somebody executes a marathon very well, and it actually works, that's also very exciting. <laughs> um, because that's very hard to do very, very hard to do. Most people can't, can't do it myself included. So, um, so yeah, no, I, I think it's not, there's been some big successes and moments over the years, but it's really just those little, you know, seeing people really, come to realization of what they're capable of. That's, that's been my favorite part. Yeah. I think as a coach, we, we believe before the athlete believes, right? And oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. It's cool. Yeah. No, wow. <laughs> did that. <laughs> it's like, yeah, you did. I told you so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Believe. So Marathon Monday is a couple days away. Where are you, where are you going to be? <laughs> well, I'll be at work, but it's it basically goes very very close to where I work. So we we sneak out and we um take a take a gander at the runners. It looks like it's going to be a nice day. Um, but yeah, no, it's super exciting. It's just exciting being downtown because you see all the they're setting things up and like all the things going on. So it's, it's very exciting time of year for sure. Yeah. I've been watching as people are going and picking up the shirts. I was like the two most asked questions in the, in the Facebook groups for Boston, what color is the shirt going to be? <laughs> yep. Jacket. And what's the cutoff time going to be for next year? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's always the big. That's always, th speaking of challenges, I have had a couple athletes over the years get their time, but not get in um, because of the, you know, the, um, the cutoff or whatever. And that, that's always very hard too. So it's a little heartbreaking, but it it is, it is heartbreaking. I mean, but I guess it keeps people excited about Boston and coming exactly. back. Exactly. 
to that's what makes Boston Boston right 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 for sure so all right Beth I think I will we'll leave it at that thank you so much for coming on I really appreciate you taking the time and letting us know a little more about you absolutely thanks for having me I enjoy it thanks